Our next speaker will be Lucas Ambrosio from Imperial College of London, and he's going to talk on free boundary minimal surface. So, thank so you. Lucas. Thank you, Vasily, very much. Thank you, the organizer, for the opportunity to be back to IMPA. It's always a, a pleasure. So today I want to talk about these objects that I find to be very beautiful, free boundary minimal hypersurfaces. And the general definition is very easy to, to give. So I want to consider a complete Riemannian manifold of dimension at least three, a region omega in N, and I want to look at compact, properly embedded, smooth hypersurfaces in this domain. So the proper properness condition only means that means two conditions, right? So I want to assume that the boundary of M is inside the boundary of the region omega. And I want to assume that there is no interior point of M touching the boundary of the region. So given such hypersurface, I will say that it is a free boundary minimal hypersurface when it has zero mean curvature vector and when it is meeting the boundary orthogonal, as you see in this picture. Um, of course, the Orthogonality condition is a very nice geometric condition you can impose on the boundary of a minimal surface. However, I think that what makes it uh, interesting is the fact that this definition is variational. So to explain this, let me recall you the first variation of area. So here we have the surface M in this region. And what I want to do is to study how the area is varying as I deform this hypersurface by the flow generated by a vector field x. Uh, but of course, there is a constraint, right? I want to keep the boundary of m inside the boundary of the region. So the admissible vector fields are those that are tangent to the boundary of omega. Then we have this uh, well-known computation for the first derivative of area. Uh, we see an interior term where we see the mean curvature vector and a boundary term where we see the conormal vector field that is the unit vector field on the surface that is orthogonal to the boundary. Right. And from that formula, it's very easy to conclude that among properly embedded hypersurfaces, the free boundary minimal ones are exactly the critical points of the area. So the plan for the talk is the following. First, I want to study free boundary minimal surface in the, mo in the simplest and most symmetric uh, domains, the balls in the Euclidean space. <laughs> we will see many examples and discuss some classification results. Then I want to uh, go to a more variational perspective and try to understand how the MOS index is controlling the topology of the minimal hypersurface. And finally, I want to study what happens when you have a sequence of compact free boundary minimal surfaces that have controlled MOS index. All right, so let's see a few pictures here. So the simplest example you can imagine of a free boundary minimal surface in the ball is, of course, the intersection of a plane with the ball, a plane passing through the origin, right? So this defines a free boundary minimal disk. Um, of course, there are many of them. We, I, we can identify them by isometries, by rotations. And I want to fix a notation here. Uh, gamma will denote the genus of the surface, and R, the number of boundary components. So he, here we have the disk, genus 0, and one boundary component. Uh, the next example is the so-called critical catenoid. So the catenoid is, of course, the only minimal surface of revolution. And it turns out that the there is only one way to fit it inside a ball so that the free boundary condition is met, so that we see an orthogonal intersection here. And this is, of course, an Um So let, maybe I should warn you that all the pictures I will show you, or rather, none of the pictures I'm showing you are mathematically accurate. So I drew them myself, so just to give you an idea of how they look like. Um, so the first non-trivial examples were found by Fraser and Shane. They showed that for each 
a natural number r, there exists a free boundary minimal surface in the ball that has genus zero and r boundary components. And in this picture, what we see here, so we see the two sides of the surface in different colors. Uh, we see the boundary, compo the boundary components in bold blue lines, right? And the surface is looking very much like two disks joined by lots of um, necks around the boundary. So the necks looks a bit like catenoids, half catenoids. And how do they construct these examples? So it's a very beautiful story. So uh, first we have to look at this general problem. So given a, any surface, compact surface, you can define this Dirichlet to Neumann map, which does the following. So given a function on the boundary, uh, you first extend it as a harmonic function to the interior by solving the Dirichlet problem. And then you take the normal derivative back to the boundary. OK? So this is a kind of non-local operator. But it has nice spectral uh, properties, right? So it has a discrete spectrum. It has eigenfunctions. Uh, and in particular, we can look at the first Steklov eigenvalue. So the name of this operator is the Steklov operator, which has this high leg type uh, characterization. So in spectral geometry, it's it, it is interesting to try to so uh, before that, so notice that the definition is rely depends on the metric, right? As I change the metric, I change the first stack of eigenvalue. And the problem would be in spectral geometry to try to maximize uh, the first eigenvalue. So here I'm multiplying by the boundary length just to make the, the thing scale invariant. Right, so what did Shen and Freite do? So they showed that on each given compact orientable surface with boundary and genus zero, this maximization problem has a solution. So it's, they found a Riemannian metric, smooth Riemannian metric, that maximizes the first stack of eigenvalue. And then they went on to prove that this metric is so special that it comes from a, a free boundary minimal immersion, embedding, sorry, of this surface into some ball. Right, so the, you see this nice relationship between a problem in spectral geometry and minimal surfaces. All right, and the final comment is that this family is converging to the equatorial disk with multiplicity two as the number of boundary components goes to infinity. So here we see the next family produced by Folia, Pakar, and Zolotareva. Uh, the picture is very similar, except that we are adding some genus here, some neck here, uh, between in the middle of the, of the disks. And the method of construction was a gluing method. Right, so more recently, uh, this construction of a desingularization of the plane in the critical catenoid has been given. So the idea is that if you add lots of handles along this singular intersection, you can perturb the picture and find a, a free boundary minimal surface with this, uh, uh, this profile. So three boundary components and large genus. So this construction I have been, I have seen announced by Martin Lee and Kaplayas for some years, but the paper hasn't appeared yet. However, in the beginning of the year, I think uh, Ketova proposed a new construction, a, no, a different construction, uh, by, by variational methods. So he did an equivalent mean max method to find uh, a guy like this, the guys like this, right? And in the same paper, Ketova constructed three isolated examples. So they are, they have the same symmetry of the platonic solids. So uh, as you know, there are five platonic solids, but by duality, there are only three symmetry group, groups. And the examples he constructed have the same symmetry groups, have these symmetry groups. They are also constructed by min max methods. They all have genus zero. And here I try to imagine how, how the one with the same symmetry of the cube looks like. It has 
six boundary components and this symmetry. All right, so given that we see lots of examples, lots of methods of construction, a natural question would be to try to classify them, right? classify the simplest ones. So let me first show you what is known about the classification of equatorial disks. So a free boundary minimum surface in the ball, in R3, is an equatorial disk when it is totally geodesic. So we have a characterization in terms of this extra geometry. It's very simple, but it's here for a reason. Um, and we also have this theorem, very important theorem by Nietzsche. So by using a Hopf differential argument, Nietzsche showed that if a free boundary minimum surface in the ball is homeomorphic to a disk, so topological condition, then it must be the equatorial disk. Right. Then it has been proven lots of time that uh, the equatorial disk is the free boundary minimum surface with the least possible area. And actually, Ketover proved that for the other surface, there is a, a gap to the next value of the area. And the last characterization I want to mention is a characterization in terms of the MOS index. So I will explain in details this later, but by now, just keep in mind that the MOS index is this number measuring um, how many directions you can find in such a way that if you push on that direction, you decrease the area of the hypersurface. So by convexity of the ball, it's fairly easy to convince yourself that the all free boundary minimum surfaces in the ball must be unstable, must have MOS index at least one. And what I'm saying here is that the equatorial disk is the only one with index one. And it's also possible to see that there is a gap for the next value of the index. Um, now how about the critical catenoid? So the situation is less clear. The first characterization was given by Fraser and Shen, so it's related to this uh, spectral problem I was discussing. You are a critical catenoid if you are homeomorphic to an analysis and is embedded by first stack of eigenfunctions. Then, in the direction of Nietzsche's result, McGrath proves the following. If you are homeomorphic to an analysis and symmetric, with respect to reflection on the three coordinate planes, then you must be a critical category. And actually, his result uses uh, this first characterization by Fraser and Chen. And then in this paper by, by Hung Tran and De Viver, they show that if you are homeomorphic to an analysis and has index four, then you must be the critical category. Right, so let me just remark, so the index of the critical catenoid is actually four. This has been computed independently by Graham Smith, the Tang Zhu, uh, Hong Tran, and the Viva. And so far, without doing this assumption here, the best we know is that an index four free boundary mineral surface must have gene zero. So as we see, we are far from having a neat picture as we have for the equatorial disk, right? And notice also that all these characterization results make a topological assumption. So what I did with Ivaldo Nunes from the Federal University of Maranhão was to, to give a, a new character to, see, to seek for a new characterization uh, in these lines. So uh, ex extrinsic characterization. So let me say the result. So let's assume we have a compact, properly embedded, free boundary mineral surface in the ball, such that this function here that takes the second component of form at a point and multiply by the normal component of the position vector of this point. And let's assume this is bounded by two. Then the conclusion we have two possibilities. Either this function is identically zero, and of course, in this case, you have the equatorial disk, or the maximum of this function is two, and you see the critical catenoid. Right. 
And notice that we are not making any topological assumption. And this looks a bit like a gap result for the second fundamental form. In fact, an inspiration for us was this classical result by Chern, Kobayashi, and Do Carmo, also proved by Lawson, about closed mineral surface in the round sphere. So if the second fundamental form is bounded by M, then either you see the simplest one, the equator, the totally geodesic equator, or this is constant, and you see the Clifford hypersurface, which are products of spheres, of round spheres. All right, so later on, it was pointed out to us that Mix, Paris, and Ross proved a similar result with a similar proof um, about complete minimal surface in R3. Actually, in a paper about constant mean, constant, stable constant mean coverage of surface, a long paper. But there you can find this proposition. If you are properly embedded minimal surface in R3, satisfying this condition, so notice that here I'm taking the norm of the X, which is a stronger condition than the normal part of X, then either you see a plane or you attain the maximum and you see the, the, the catenary, the whole catenary. All right, so let's go through the key steps of the proof. So the first step is to realize that this condition here means exactly that the function that associates to each point on the surface, the square distance to the origin, is a convex function. The Haitian is non-negative, right? This is a well-known observation due to Brian White, I believe. Well, once you have a convex function, you have lots of structure. Just remind the just remember the soul theorem, for example. So let's take a look on the set of points of minima. So using convexity, we can show that this is a connected, totally convex submanifold, smooth submanifold of M of the, the surface, right? And totally convex means that uh, if you have two points on the set and these two points are joined by a geodesic, then the geodesic itself lies inside the set. All right, so since we know it's a totally geodesic submanifold, there are two possibilities. Either you see uh, a single point, or you see a closed geodesic. Right, so here, let me remark that we are using the free boundary condition because, so since we are looking at a compact surface, it's not clear that given two points, you can join them by a geodesic, right? But because of the free boundary condition, we know that intrinsically uh, the minimal surface, free boundary minimal surface is uh, convex. So the boundary is a convex curve. So we can minimize the distance between two points. There, are, there is always a geodesic between two points. Okay, so then we have to analyze the two possibilities. So if, if this set C is a single point, then you can retract everything to a point, you basically conclude that M is homeomorphic to a disk, and you can use niche result to prove M is an equatorial disk. So in the other case, uh, what's happening is the following. So let's think about the situation. Because of the, this, the geometric meaning of this function, right, what we see is uh, that M is outside the ball of radius rho, rho the minimum of norm of x, and m is touching this sphere along c. So if c is a geodesic in m, it must be a geodesic in the sphere. And therefore, we know what it is. It's a circle on a plane through the origin. And the final step is to get a rotational symmetry from this information, which goes by the study of um, the Jacobi function uh, associated to rotation along the, the axis orthogonal to the plane. So basically you prove, well, we did the proof using an, uh, uh, the knowledge of the nodal set, the set where this function vanishes, and the theorem of Cheng to conclude that U must vanish identically, and therefore M is rotational, M is a critical category. So this is the proof. 
Okay, so let's move on to the next topic. Let me explain you what the MOS index is. Uh, the MOS index is related to the second variation of area. So let's go back to the, the situation before. So we have a critical point of the area functional, a compact free boundary minimum hypersurface in a domain. And for simplicity, let's assume M is two sided. It has a unit normal vector field, and that our vector field is everywhere normal to the hypersurface. So uh, M is a critical point of the area, so the first derivative is zero, is zero. So let's look at the second derivative. And the formula is the formula. Uh, so here we see the gradient of the function, the bridge curvature of the ambient manifold, the second form of the, form of the hypersurface, and this boundary term where you see uh, the second fundamental form of the boundary of omega inside the inside M. Right, so this nice formula here defines, allows us to define a quadratic form on the space of functions. And the index is just the index, the algebraic index of this quadratic form. So it's the largest dimension of a linear subspace V of the space of functions where the index form is negative definite in the sense that it gives you a negative number for all non-zero elements in this subspace. So as you see, we are counting the number of uh, directions in which we can push the surface and decrease the area. So make this negative, make the second derivative negative. Right, so this is a good definition to estimate the index from below. However, to compute it precisely, maybe it's better to give you this alternative definition. So if you integrate by parts, you see this expression here. And the index you can prove to be just the number of negative eigenvalues for this problem here. So you have the Jacob operator plus lambda and this natural uh, Hobbing type boundary condition. Okay, so why do, do we care about the index? So one reason is that by a, uh, it's, it is a general principle. So every time you have a variational method, either a minimization method or a min-max method, the critical points you find, the mi free boundary minimum hypersurface you find, have controlled index, right? For example, if you m just minimize, you expect to find something with index zero, which is stable. So. Since this is the only a priori knowledge you can expect about your hypersurface, it's, it's, it's interesting to try to relate the index and, of course, the ambient geometry. The index is very sensitive to the ambient geometry to understand the object you produce. Right? And this is, of course, an old theme in geometry. And just to mention two landmark results. So Shen Yao, in their study of positive scalar curvature, and the proof of the Wilmot conjecture by Andrea Marquez and Fernando Coda. All right, so this is the, the, this is the motivation. Um, so what I did with Alessandro Carlotto, who is now is at the ETA in Zurich, and Ben Shah, who is in Warwick, is to try to understand how the index is controlling uh, the better numbers of the free boundary minimum hypersurface. And the theorem we obtain is this one. So for simplicity, let, let us assume we are in the Euclidean space and that we have a compact orientable two-sided properly embedded free boundary minimum hypersurface. So if the dimension is 2 and the boundary of omega is mean convex, the mean curvature vector is pointing, it's not pointing outside, then you have this index estimate. So the index is bounding genus and number of boundary components linearly. 
any higher dimensions? We proved that the index is controlling the first relative Betty number. Uh, these, these topological number measures uh, a few things. In particular, this number is always greater or equal than the number of boundary components minus one. So the index controls the number of boundary components in particular. OK, so unfortunately, I don't think I have much time to discuss uh, about the proof of this or make other comments than to, to, to point out to this corollary, which links to the next uh, topic. So Fraser and Martin Lee proved the following compactness result. So if you are, if you are in a Riemannian manifold with no negative rich curvature, and you have a, a domain, a region that is strictly convex, then, given a sequence of compact, properly embedded, free boundary minimal surface in omega that have genus and number of boundary components uniformly bounded, then this sequence has a subsequence converging to a free boundary minimal surface uh, that satisfies the same topological bound. And the convergence is the, the best one you can expect. It's a smooth and one-sheeted graphical convergence. So, in view of our result, the index controls the topology. So we can state the following corollary. If omega is a compact, strictly convex domain in R3, then bounding the MOS index gives you compactness. Because the MOS index bounds the topology, the topology gives you convergence, and the index passes to the limit by this nice notion of convergence. OK, so now we, we are ready for the next uh, and last uh, topic. And the question is, what can we say about a sequence of compact free boundary minimal hypersurface that has uniformly bounded index and uniformly bounded area? And I want to state uh, uh, this result. So also joint, with, joint work with Alessandro Carlotto and Ben Sharp. So if you, are, if you are in a Riemannian manifold of dimension at most six, with no negative rich curvature, and you have a compact, smooth, strictly convex domain in this manifold, then the set of compact, properly embedded, free boundary minimal hypersurface in omega that have mass index and volume bounded by this constant C is compact in the strongest sense. OK, so the last minutes, let me give you an overview of the proof. So the first two key observations are the following. If you look at a, a small ball and variations supported at that ball, and you find that M is stable on that ball, free boundary is stable on that ball, then you have curvature estimates in a smaller ball. This is a consequence of the work of Shane Simon. And this is good because curvature estimates is what you need to prove uh, graphical conversions. Now, how the index enters, so by this elementary observation. If the index is p, and we have p plus 1 disjoint set, then we know for sure that at most one intersection must be stable. Right? Why is that? Because of the definition of the index. If, I've, if every one of them were unstable, we will find for each one of them a deformation decrease in the area but then they would span a space of dimension p plus 1, decrease in the area, contradiction. And this, just by these two observations, we can conclude the following. So if we have a sequence with bounded index in the area, 
the set of points where things go wrong, so the set of points of where the index is concentrating, must be finite, bounded by the index. And outside it, we see smooth locally graphical uh, convergence to a smooth object that I denote M0. Okay. So the next step, so we have this M0 and maybe those punctures. The next step would be to see if we can extend M0 smoothly across the punctures. So let me show you three kinds of behavior that you need to somehow deal with. The first one is this one. So we have this half neck pinching on the boundary to the point Y. Right? And here in this uh, simple situation, it's clear that we have a removal singularity. Okay, then we have the situation where our interior uh, neck is shrinking and converging to the boundary. So ideally, we would be able to prove that this is also a removal singularity, but notice that it's, it's an interior point of M touching the boundary, so it's an improper uh, boundary point. And then we could have a boundary component shrinking, like when you do the blowdown of the upper part of the catenoid. But ag again, we expect a removal singularity. And maybe an improper, and yes, and an improper contact. Anyway, using the index assumption and uh, a foliation argument similar to the one Brian White used in his compactness uh, result, we proved this removal singularity lemma. And therefore, if you add the bad points to M0, you do see a smooth embedded free boundary minimal hypersurface. Right. So next, uh, we use the, the assumption on the boundary, the maximum principle, to rule out improper uh, intersections. And then, we have to analyze the multiplicity. And the idea is that when you have multiplicity, you can construct Jacobi fields that have a sign on the limit. So you would conclude that the limit is stable, free boundary is stable, and this is a situation ruled out by the curvature assumptions. And the last step is to see that when the multiplicity is one, a standard argument by Allard uh, by uh, using the Allard theorem and the free boundary version of it, the gruter yost theorem, implying that uh, ultimately you don't have bad points of convergence and smooth graphical convergence everywhere. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you.